Well, I'm Carrie Nermo. I've worked with data for more than 30 years, uh, from DBase2 and Access, and now through to SQL Server, Azure Data Studio, and of course, all sorts of cloud uh, iterations. Um, as we take our high level uh, down to a deep dive with Azure Data Studio, uh, I just wanted to give you a few few tidbits about um, what Azure Data Studio is. Um, and so just so you know, there's no need to switch from SQL Server Management Studio. This is just another tool in your toolbox. Uh, it's predominantly used, uh, I would suspect, by developers, not so much DBAs. And uh, so let's, let's get going. Okay, we're going to start with a, an active poll uh, from Slido. Uh, I'll give everyone a couple of minutes, um, hopefully. Everyone has their cell phone. Sharon, I know you don't. And let's see if if we get any results. So I want to find out what your experience is with the Azure Data Studio. Oh! Oh! What? Great. Wow, this is wonderful. Okay, let's keep going. Here's our next question. Only two questions in this exam. That is cool, Carrie. I've never used Slido before, and I wish I'd had it for my past session. This would have been so cool. <laughs> I'm on the cutting edge of technology always. Yes, okay. you are. Okay, well, I'm a little disappointed for Mac and Linux. Not so popular. Uh, poor Randolph. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so now, unfortunately, I don't have, like I said, I don't have access to an enterprise level data budget. So um, most of what I'm going to present to you is based on the free tier, which I know everyone has access to. And so I'm hoping that some people don't know that there's actually two versions of Azure Data Studio. Um, right now, there's the generally available one, which is what I'm going to be using today. But there's also the one with features that have not necessarily been released to the general public and you can sort of fiddle around with that. Um, now unfortunately the second second one is a little more buggy uh, than the generally accepted one. So I and Larry will appreciate this, I am a very much a big picture person. The big picture of Azure Data Studio is that it's cross-platform open source. Um, that in itself has many good things uh, with it. On the one hand, if you're sitting at home with your Mac, you can access your SQL Server databases, the company ones, uh, on your Mac at home. And open source is good, but it also says we will be slow and there's a lot of people who don't know each other working on it. Um, the nice thing is you can execute your SQL queries. This is, this is the key thing. Even with SQL Server uh, Management Studio, you want to execute your SQL ser que queries. And there's a number of integrated analytics tools. So um, if you're familiar with VS Code, uh, you will appreciate the built-in terminal, the Git support, uh, PowerShell commands at your fingertips so you don't have to memorize all 200 of them. And as much as open source is good and bad, it does have a very active community. And in general, there are 2,000 issues raised per month. There's a release every single month. There's about 40 people working on it actively. And um, I think about three or 400 branches. So all you have to do is go to the GitHub um, page and you'll be able to download it. So now the best features. The best features are that you can create and manage all of your databases. Now, even though this is open source and it's 
all the time being worked on. And right now, the only things you can access are Azure Cloud, SQL Server, and Postgres. Um, you, there are down the turnpike uh, coming in that you'll be able to uh, connect to Redis and um, all sorts of other data platforms. The extensions, because this is forked from VS Code, you mostly have a lot of the extensions from VS Code, which includes creating your personal environment, um, and uh, creating snippets that you can you can send to the marketplace. Uh, and the two biggest features, and I think this is what sells Azure Data Studio, is that you can do notebooks. Now, notebooks have two different reasons why you want to use a notebook. On the one hand, you can, if you've got 40 scripts for each database, you can put those all into one notebook, put notes on them, and send them around the office, and they will they will go with your database, um, uh, and uh, and it's a single repository. Uh, with projects, the nice thing is with projects is that you can you can not only send your the database that you're working on from qual to prod. Um, you can also uh, try out features. So for instance, if you want to add a reward um, basis and you want to just connect up the schema, you can create that project without touching your original uh, database. And of course, the best attributes, and these sort of carry through with most Microsoft products, uh, IntelliSense. Where would we be? Where would the lazy developers be without IntelliSense? Because it's going to complete your your um, uh, SQL commands uh, quite quickly. Um, also, it's easy to use, really. And if you are very familiar with SQL Server, there's virtually no upskilling. Uh, and it also integrates familiar commands. And these are ones that are sometimes buried deep, deep, deep within uh, SQL Server Management Studio. And yet in Azure Data Studio, there are only one or two clicks. I actually kind of look to see how to create a notebook in uh, SQL Server Management Studio just the other day, and it took 13 clicks. Uh, in Azure Data Studio, it takes two. Uh, the other thing, which is kind of a lifesaver, especially for developers, is speed. Uh, depending on how large your databases get, uh, you will really appreciate the amount of time it takes to, uh, to complete your SQL query. So we're going to go into a bit of a deep dive here and just want to recap some of the use cases. So. I'm not going to say this is the this is the tool you will want to use, but it is it is a fabulous tool. It is convenient. Um, it allows multiple connections at your fingertips, and it's got built in a fair amount of comfort. So depending on whether you're just writing queries, um, there's a certain amount of familiarity. There's uh, a bit of reporting and visualization, which is great. Uh, as a developer, you're going to love this. As a DBA, maybe not so much because, you know, if you want to reduce those log files, you'll want to go back into SQL Server Management Studio because you cannot do that in Azure Data Studio. But you know what? Your cornerstones of success are going to be fast results and a fair amount of collaboration. So, we're going to go into demo time, and I'm just going to, hopefully this will work. I think I have to do that and go in here. Now, when you, when you start up Azure Data Studio, this is basically what you're going to find. You can launch uh, queries and notebooks, uh, deploy a ser server, create a connection right from the get-go. And if you continue down, there's, there's a bunch of uh, tutorials. Um, your history, um, 
additional things. Um, and right now, like I said, they only have Postgres, but they are looking forward to to getting more more uh, data sources. Um, I think right now Power BI has over a hundred. So this Azure Data Studio is um, very much an infant if you will. Um, and as you can see also, um, the background color, uh, this I think is called, let's see, where's my color themes? This is called uh, HCQ, uh, which is so much better than just like bright white on bright white. Um, but here on the left sidebar, uh, you've got your connections, your uh, search bar, your notebooks, your projects, uh, your PowerShell commands, which um, if you've ever had to try and remember what they are, you will love this because it gives you, it gives you all of them. It's just starting up here, but it will soon populate. Um, oh, I shall not do that. Oh, apparently I have to update PowerShell. Um, this is uh, your uh, open explorer, so this will tell you what queries you have on the go um, and other resources that you have. Uh, you can link to your Git repositories and, of course, the wonderful Git, ex or not Git extent, but VS Code like extensions. And there's quite a few. The nice thing is, is that the marketplace is just rife with a bunch of them. Um, you can see down here, I think there's, uh, uh, seems to me they they had a Redis one. Maybe it's being updated. Okay. Okay. Um, but you know what? Let's, let's dive into a database. So here's another wonderful thing. Right now, um, like I said, there's only Postgres, SQL Server, and... Um, cloud and so I've created categories because if you have numerous connections you'll want to organize them and you don't have to stick to these three you could have a prod and a qual um, you could have any number of, of uh, uh, delineations here um, here's one of my uh, connections I call him site kraken um, but I also have a SQL test and I have a playground so uh, we'll just pop in here go to the databases. And I'm just going to show you a few things. So here we are on the famous north wind. Um, and you can go in here and manage this one. Here's This is what you'll see. Um, and this is what you can do is you can add your own widgets here. So if you want to see, um, you know, like right now I've got the slowest queries over here. Uh, this is telling me all the different um, excuse me, tables, um, fragmentation, but you could add almost anything here. Uh, there's a number, there's some SQL reports. Oh, see, look, DB Gender has logs that are out of control. So I'll have to go in and check on those. But um, some of these are built in and some of these are available from the marketplace. Uh, and like I said, it's it's rife with them. Um, I have not tried the machine learning, but um, I'm going to, because I think I need a polybase uh, thing for that. Now, on the downside, it does show you what your schemas are. The problem is, is that you can't move anything. Uh, you, whoops, uh, you can only kind of zoom in and zoom out, which is, which is kind of unfortunate. But you know what? I know someone's raised an issue for that. I know it will be something that we'll be able to do in the future. So let's go. I think we're going to do notebooks right now. So the nice thing is, is that, so I've created just a couple of quick little notebooks. Um, and these are things, if you remember, all of your scripts for a database can be stored here. You can collaborate with your peers. And just like, um, just like, uh, uh, Jupyter Notebooks, um, they have kind of a little bit of the same functionality. So I did a quick analysis of my name, my mom's name, and Jemima. I picked Jemima because of, you know, I miss Aunt Jemima syrup. But we're just going to run all of these. Whoops. Did I spell that? Uh, I just got to spell that correctly. 
There we go. So it will run everything. Um, and we'll go back up to the top. So here, this is uh, coming from my database called DB Gender. Uh, this was a baby name uh, database that just uh, goes back to uh, 1880. There's almost 2 million rows. Um, and if we go down here. So here is um, the popular names for girls. Um, Mary is four times as likely almost as Elizabeth. Uh, here is James and John is the top two uh, boys' names. And this is, oh, this is Carrie by gender. So we're going to, at this point, we can export this data, like this tiny little table, table into Excel, CSV, uh, text, uh, JSON, or we can do a little graphic on it. Now, this is not pretty yet, but uh, with a few, few slights of hand, let's see. My Y is the count, count of carries. And my X is oh, years. Oops. We always have that possibility. Oh, there we go. Okay, so this is how popular carry was. And obviously, uh, I have some little comments down here. Um, my name was the most popular in 1977, and that's about the almost the same year that the movie Carrie came out. Coolie. Um, this is, uh, let's just run this and fix this all up. Do a vertical. We'll do none. And we'll just pretend we know that it's the, oops, none. I have to move that. There we go. Uh, so here's Shirley, and rightly so. It was during the mid '30s that uh, my mom's name was pretty popular. But here's the the clincher. When I did um, this is Jemima, and we'll just go and configure our chart very quickly. I'll get rid of those. Look at how popular Jemima is starting to be. <laughs> There was like one when she started the syrup and or posed for the syrup and now her name is quite popular in as of 2018. So that's one of my my more adorable uh, little analyses. It's pretty fast. Um, here's another one. Uh, Randolph, you're going to appreciate this. Uh, here we go. And you can include pictures, you can include text. Um, uh, this is even at its in 2000, there were five times as many carries as there were Randolph's. The bizarre thing is, is that there's Carrie as a boy's name and Randolph as a girl's name is also kind of popular. I was, I was shocked by this, shocked, utterly shocked. But so those were just a couple of fun, fun little things with my notebooks. Uh, and we're going to do a couple of, oh, let's just go and close all these. And there we go. And we'll go in and do a couple of scripts. Okay. Uh, da, da, da. We're going to open. This was just a little speed test. Um, now this is a bit of a bug where, where you're constantly being bumped out of your connection stream. There we go. Uh, and as you can see, oops, I'm gonna move you over. Uh, it took uh, four, uh, 1.5 uh, seconds, I guess. Um, if I can pop over to uh, SQL Server, and we'll run the same. I hope you guys can all st still see this. Uh, we're going to um, open. Oh, shoot. Uh, open, open, open. 
Oh! Help me out, Randolph. You're demonstrating to me. Well, <laughs> Just say I, new query. A new qu no, it's not a new query because I want to open under a file. Open a file. There we go. Oh, see yes. how hard this is? Here's our speed test in and uh, execute. There we go. Oh, now that only took 320, <laughs> which really kind of defies my point. <laughs> that's <laughs> <not good. laughs> oh, that's that's hysterical. Okay, I'm not going to use that one anymore. Uh, let's try our second one. <laughs> Can you try running try running it again through? Uh, yeah, through Data Studio, it may have cached it. That is true. Uh, see, now we're yeah, down yeah. to 164. Which is kind of fun. Funny. <laughs> okay, so we're going to open up our second one. Uh, Frank, had I known you would you would come from Chicago, I would. Oh, maybe I'll just change this. Uh, Illinois, I L, is that right? Yeah. That is correct. Uh, and we'll just do this vertical. Uh, we will do none. Um, here we go. Oh, oh. Um, uh, hang on. We have to. We're not doing that. We're doing. Um, oh, see, still a smidge buggy. Um, oh, this works better. I betcha. In Sand Dance. So this is a little visualization tool that comes with Azure Data Studio called Sand Dance. It is the best thing since sliced bread. I got to tell you. Um, you can create stacks, and we're going to go, um, I'll go gender. No, that's too lame. Um, we'll go, oh, do we even want to do race? Uh, by Y axis. Um, so here we have, and you can actually uh, click through each one of these items and it will highlight what you've got going on. Um, and you can pick your different color charts sort of thing. Um, and I just have one more because I see that either, I must have started really late. Is that right, Randolph? We, uh, this, this always happens. We started a little late, but also when you're presenting, you get into it and you lose track of time. This is normal. Okay. Well, you know what? Here's my last one um, because this one looks great um, in Sand Dance. Uh, and we're going to do stacks. Uh, we will do, I think I did uh, cost, product ID, count, and we're going to sort by or color by um that and we're going to oh no maybe we there is no end of of fun stuff to do with this um i can't wait for this to get a little bit better um seven you can do the number of bins you want oh that's because uh, da, 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 da. uh but you can also create snapshots um, this will uh, go into any presentation. The problem that they're still experiencing is that if you have made your environment dark gray like mine, it will. that's how it's coming in. So let's pop back over to, uh, to my uh, from current slide. So... Oh, there is so much more to come with Azure Data Studio. Um, I'm going to have my repo, which has um, a bit more information, and also my slides uh, will be available on my, my repo, and I'll send those to Randolph. And uh, I want to thank, thank you guys for listening to me. And now, as a last little thing, what's your 2021 data mantra? I loved this when I first saw it. I thought, oh, I'm going to share that with the group. That is cool. Randolph, what are you? Apparent, 
Mine's apparently making the most of regression analysis. Wow. <laughs> I am not going to be afraid of the cloud. <laughs> there you go. I like that. <laughs> That's amazing. Thank you, Carrie. All right. So I am going to talk about backup and restore options for SQL Server in Azure. Um, Randolph already covered this. Um, my contact information is here. Uh, Twitter will probably get you the fastest response, uh, but if you email me, I will be I will get back to you. Um, if you have any questions about anything I talk about in here, I would be happy to answer them. Um, I joke that my wife I like to talk about this stuff, and my wife doesn't. So any and all questions are welcome. Um, and I do have a blog. Unfortunately, I have not updated it much of late. I am hoping that the updates will be more frequent in the near future. Uh, but just to talk a little bit about what we're going to cover, I'm going to give a brief overview about SQL Server options in Azure, um, two main ones, infrastructure as a service and platform as a service, and then the backup and restore options for both of those. Um, if you're not familiar, uh, with the terms, I will say IaaS and PaaS as opposed to infrastructure and a service or platform as a service. Um, under PaaS, there are two main options. There is Azure SQL Database. Talk a little bit about what that is and then Managed Instance, and I'll describe what that is. And then for IaaS, um, the different options you've got for running backups. And you might ask why I put this presentation together. So over the past two years or so, I've been working with clients, running SQL Server in Azure, and exploring the various backup options. And there are too many choices. Um, you know, you've got multiple options for running SQL Server, and then within each one of those options, there are different methods that you can use to back SQL Server up, and there are things that I have learned over those two years that I think it's valid to share, valuable to share with others to hopefully um, help you avoid the pain that I've gone through. Um, so to talk about SQL Server options in Azure, um, subtitle here is how managed is managed. So SQL Server, or sorry, Azure provides managed services, and there are different levels of management so the infrastructure as a service or IaaS is basically SQL Server running on an Azure VM. So you can think about this like you you are when you stand one of these up Azure is your hosting provider. It's the same thing as if you have a VM running, you know, in a data center or at a different hosting provider um, and there are two different ways that you can stand one of these up. Uh, the first one is you can provision a an Azure VM, and then you can do a SQL Server install, just like you would on any other machine. Or one of the nice things about it is that there are marketplace images available where you can choose to provision an, a VM running a specific OS. And I believe that Windows goes from 2008 R2 up to 2019, and then SQL Server, once again, goes from 2008 R2 to 2019. And just with the click of a button, you can provision the VM, SQL Server will be installed, um, and you can just start playing around with it. And then the same is true with Linux. You can stand up Linux VMs running SQL Server. Um, so you can um, reduce the cost. And with those marketplace images, you can stand up different versions of SQL Server. So you can stand up a developer instance. Um, you won't be charged for the SQL Server licensing. Um, the infrastructure here is all client managed. So OS patching and SQL patching is all the responsibility of you if you've stood one of these up. And then backups can be client managed. Um, but there are options, and I'll get deeper into those in a little bit, to automate management of backups. So that's IaaS, and then the platform as a service or PaaS. The infrastructure here is fully managed. So you stand up an Azure SQL database or a managed instance. The patching of the OS and the patching of SQL Server is going to be handled by Azure, and backups will be scheduled and run by Azure. 
Um, so I said there are two different options. There's managed instance and SQL database. The managed instance is very similar to an instance of SQL Server that you're used to running. Um, you can run cross database queries. So if you have three part names, you can use those in a against the managed instance and it has SQL Server agent available to it. Um, as I said, it, it, it is an instance of SQL Server that is managed. And then the other option is the single database option. And this is a single database and it runs on a, an Azure resource called an Azure SQL Server. You can have multiple Azure SQL databases, the single databases on a, an Azure SQL Server, uh, but you can't run cross database or cross instance queries. So if you have three part names that you're running, um, you won't be able to use those against an Azure SQL database. And there is no SQL Server agent. Um, so the use case for the two different options, a managed instance is basically there. If you have an existing SQL Server environment, it is much easier to move that environment to managed instance than it is to try and kind of reconfigure or re-engineer your database solution to leverage single database. So single databases are basically there for net new development. Um, if you have a website that needs a database, um, you can stand up a, uh, a single database and potentially reduce your costs. Uh, so that's the difference between the two. So any questions before I jump into the backup and restore options for platform as a service? I don't see any raised hands, so you can okay. go on. All right, so uh, the backup options for PaaS, basically they are fully managed. So when you stand up a single database or a managed instance, um, the backup schedule and backup location are determined um, schedule based on some rules that Azure's got, and then the location is based on the region that you're running in. Um, you can set limits on backup retention and uh, you cannot access the backup files here. So it's fully managed. Uh, Azure is taking these backups. They are writing them to the location that they determine. And then an important thing is that third-party tools cannot back up PaaS databases. Um, the Microsoft has not exposed the APIs for backing up these databases. So if you have a third party vendor who tells you that they can do this, they are either wrong or lying. And I have run into both, I think I've run into both cases. Um, you can export a single database to a backpack file. So if you're familiar with um, data tier application files or backpack files, you can generate these through uh, Management Studio, um, you can do the same thing with an Azure, uh, the single database offering. So if you need to pull this database down, it can be done, but it's not um, meant as an enterprise backup solution. Effectively, what a backpack file does is script out all of the objects in the database and then script out the data. Uh, it will actually generate a a series of insert statements. So they're singleton inserts. So it's not it's not there. It's it's there to move data. It's not necessarily there to back things up and restore them. The schedule, I said that the schedule is determined by Azure. Um, when you create a single database or you have a managed instance and you restore a new database to it, Azure will automatically take a full backup. And then once that full backup completes, if the database is in full recovery, log backups will start to run. Um, and then from that point, you will get a full backup weekly. There will be a differential daily, and you can actually specify um, if you want that backup to run every 12 hours or 24 hours. And then the log backup will run every five to 15 minutes. And that frequency is based on your transactional volume. So if you have an application that runs very hot from say like 2 p.m. to 6 p.m., during that period where you're generating a lot of transactional volume, it will 
run those log backups more frequently. And then as that transactional load um, backs off, they will run less frequently. Um, so it just I, have, you... I do have a question about that. Sure. Um, I, I, it, does that hold true for managed instance as well? Yes. Yes. Yeah, so these okay. rules are good. They, they apply to both both of the PaaS offerings. So it works the same way. So I said that you can't control backup schedule. You also can't control backup location. And when the the backup files are geo redundant, so if you're running in East US, and that backup will be generated, and then two copies, two additional copies, will be written to different locations in that region, and then a fourth copy will be written out to the regional pair. And I believe for East US, that's East US two. Um, so this gives you kind of additional redundancy. If East US goes away completely, you will still have access to a backup file and can um, restore from that. Um, and then we talk about retention. So you've got point in time recovery and when the default value is seven days and there are tiers within both single database and managed instance, uh, the basic tier and the hyperscale tier, that is your limit. You only have seven days of recoverability. Uh, for basic, that is a cost thing. Basic is the least expensive of the tiers. And then hyperscale, uh, too deep to get into for this presentation, but the retention period or the way the architecture of the database is different. And so you have other options for recoverability past that seven day limit. Um, you can increase for the other tiers, you can increase this point in time recovery to 35 days. And for all of them, you can decrease it below seven down to one. You also have the ability to do long-term retention. And I'll show you what this looks like in the portal in a minute, but you can retain weekly backups for a period of time, monthly backups for a period of time, and yearly backups for a period of time. And so this is for applications that have auditing requirements. You need to keep a hold of data for 10 years. Um, you can do this with weekly, monthly, and yearly backups. And then I mentioned the backpack file, being able to um, generate a backpack file for a single database. Managed instance gives you the ability to run full copy only backups. So if you want to pull a full copy only of your um, production database to restore to a lower, you know, to a test environment or a, a quality environment, you can do that. Um, the one caveat here is that you've got to write the backup to Azure Blob Storage. There's no local drive that you can access to write that backup to. So you write it to Azure Blob Storage, and then you can pull it down from there and restore it somewhere else. So any questions before I kick to my demos? We have uh, Carrie's hand up. I just wanted to double check that she has a question. Okay. Yep, I do. Um, so I know... Uh, Cost is always forefront when I'm using Azure Cloud. Um, with blob storage, with the numerous backups, is um, how how does the cost structure work for that? Is it is it just is it on a gigabyte level, or is it um, how many ins and how many outs? So you get. Um, I, I've got to refresh my memory, but it, it, based on what I've read, you get 1x backup space included in your price. And then if you kick that retention up, you will incur additional costs. And it it's region specific. You know, different regions have different prices. They're all within a couple of cents per gigabyte but I want to say the average is about six cents per gigabyte for storage. So if you do exceed that one X, the cost isn't prohibitive. 
Um, I don't know if I've got a link in the resource to the estimator, but there are uh, cost estimators for all of this stuff, including that backup. So you can tell it, okay, I want 35 days point in time retention, and I want to retain X number of weekly, X number of monthly, X number of yearly backups, and it will tell you what the estimated cost will be. So, so, if, so does that mean that the blob storage is elastic? Yes. Or, okay. No, it is. Blob storage is, you can use as much of it as you want, and they won't stop you because they're going to send you a bill. <laughs> of course. Yes. So, all right. Any other questions? Not that I can see. Okay. I'm going to try doing this with the slides. Um, is that visible? Yes, we can see okay. a yellow pointer and the restore is highlighted. Okay, cool. So um, this is the portal and I am looking at a SQL server and there is an option for backups. And so when I look at that, it shows me that I have a database called FPG SQL XVTDB01. And I have, this is an old slide. Actually, you know what? I'm going to jump to the portal so it is more current. So this is the same thing we were just looking at on the slide, but this is actually in the portal. So I have a database called FPG SQL DB1. It is running on server FPG SQL DB SRV1. And this is my available backups. That is the only database I've got. And my earliest point in time restore point is from the 23rd of August at 8.09 p.m. UTC time. Um, so from here, I can do a couple of different things. I can click restore. Uh, and you'll also notice that I don't have any available long-term retention backups. And I'll jump to that in a second. But if I want to restore this, I just click the restore button and it will take me to this pane. And tells me what subscription and resource group I'm in, my database name, and then my source here is point in time. That is my only option right now. I could select long-term backup retention, but I don't have any of them right now. And then it shows me that earliest restore point. So I can go back to that 8.09 p.m. on the 23rd of August. And then this is my most recent restore point. So it will default to the last restore point. Um, so there was a log backup or some sort of backup was taken at 12 a.m. If I wanted to go back earlier than that, I can choose the calendar here, select a different date, give it that point in time time, and then it will just automatically do all of the restores necessary. It will restore the full backup, and it will restore the last differential backup, and then it will restore all of the log backups it needs to get to that point in time. Another thing to point out here is that with these offerings, you don't have the ability to do a replace. So if I, in a normal SQL Server instance, I would be able to say, okay, I've got this database name, I want to restore over the existing database. I give it a with replace clause and it will do that. This will not let you do that. So it will restore, you need to restore it as a different name oh, and then drop the previous database and do a rename. Or if you're confident in your restore, you could drop it on the front end and then restore with the same name. Um, but just so you know that that's there. And then um, you are, because you are creating a new database, you have a couple of different options. Um, you can do, you can use what's called an elastic pool. Once again, that's a little bit outside the scope of this, but an elastic pool is effectively a pool of resources. So if I have, I gave that example before where I've got a web application that uses a database. If I have multiple clients that are using the same web app and I want to create a database per client, I can provision what's called an elastic pool and then each one of those databases will pull resources from that pool. So it's another way to save money. And then it defaults to the tier of the database that's being restored, but I can change that. Um, so in this case, I'm using standard. I can 
switch to basic premium or I can flip to the vCore model, which is a different way of provisioning um, resources to a database. Once again, a little bit outside of the scope, but just know that you can bump this up or down. So if I have a production database that's running at a really high level, I want to restore it for a test environment, I can drop the tier down to save money. And then finally, I can specify backup storage redundancy. So it defaults to geo redundant, but I can set it to locally redundant and zone redundant. These are both in preview, but that will be another way to reduce cost. So if you're going from prod to test, you don't necessarily need geo redundant backups for test. You can set that to locally redundant. Um, and then you click review and create, and it will then kick off that restore process. And depending on the size of your database, that process can take some time, but it's something that you'd want to test out to see how long that's going to run for your databases. Um, so I think that takes us, that's the demo of the restore process. Um, if I jump back over here, so that's available backups. This is retention policies. So if I click the check mark here and configure policies, this is where I can set that um, long-term retention. And this is where I can flip that differential from 12 to 24 hours. And then the long-term retention weekly, I can keep you know, days, weeks, months, or years for a period of time. Um, I can keep that monthly backup for the same period and then yearly uh, down here. Yeah, I could potentially do up to 10 years if I wanted to do this. And, and then you have the ability to select which, which weekly backup you want to keep. So do you want to keep the first backup of the year? Do you want to keep the 52nd backup of the year? Do you want to keep something in the middle? You can do that. If I click apply here, it Gives me an are you sure? Click yes. And it will take a little bit of time to make the change. But if I refresh this, ah, it's still deploying. So when this comes back, um, you will see, there you go. Keep one week one for 10 years. Um, so once again, this will add uh, it will add a charge because you're, you're going to be using additional storage. Um, it's not going to be exorbitant, but just keep in mind that that will add some cost to your use of Azure. So that should take us through the demo. And let me flip through the screenshots that I had. This is all the stuff that I just went through. So any questions about the backup and restore options for PaaS, Randall? I don't see any questions, but I it's it's a uh, I'm going to be one of those people and say this is more of a comment than a question. I I had never actually considered which backup that I would want to keep for the annual backup. You know, you never think about stuff like that, but I'm glad to see that Microsoft did. That's cool. You're you're back on mute again. I think you bumped your button again. There we go. There okay. Go. Yes. So yes, you can you can choose weeks one one through fifty two. So if you want to grab week twenty six, you can do that. But yes, Microsoft has thought about. It. All right. Awesome. Oh, and we have a, a raised hand from Evan. Go okay. ahead, Evan. I was just curious uh, what your what your thoughts were um, from backing databases up in Azure uh, to traditional uh, the backup traditional process with on premises. Uh, recovery solutions? Um, so, it, I mean, basically you have, you don't have control over the backups. You don't know where they are. You can't get a hold of the actual backup files. But in terms of restoring, I mean, the backup schedule is kind of the default schedule that I set up, you know, for myself or for clients where you're running a full weekly. And that's dependent. I mean, I, I have clients who run fulls nightly, but if I am running differential backups, you know, I'm going to run a full on Sunday and then a differential backup the rest of the week, and then I'm going to run log backups at some frequency. Um, 
for a lot of applications, five to 15 minutes, maybe a little bit of overkill. But I think that you get, you have protection. I mean, if you've got seven days of point in time restore, you have the ability to restore to any point in time in that seven day window. Um, so I, I am comfortable with this as a managed solution. I mean, if you, if you have requirements where you're not comfortable with this, then the managed or the PaaS offering may not be for you. And I'll talk about your options with IaaS when I get into this next section. So I don't know, does that answer your question? Uh, absolutely, thank you. Okay, cool. All right. So to get into the backup and restore options for IaaS, um, because, there we go. Um, because this is basically running SQL Server on a VM, you have the options available to you that you have for a normal instance of SQL Server, and that includes running native backups. Um, so you can run backups with SQL Server agent jobs. If you've got your own process, you can stand that up, you can create those jobs, um, or you can use Ola Hallengren's maintenance solution. Um, if you're not familiar with Ola's solution, um, I've got a link in the resources section where you can go and get a hold of it. Um, the maintenance solution is what it says. It is a solution for database maintenance, and that includes backups, uh, index maintenance, and integrity checking. You can download the whole thing, or you can download it in pieces. So if you're only interested in backups, you can grab that code. But if you do download the maintenance solution and run it, it will generate a... Um, series of jobs and those the backup jobs execute a procedure called database backup um, you create the backup the backup jobs are created and you can schedule them according to your requirements but you do get a full backup job a diff backup job and a log backup job um, so you can do all of that stuff and let's see jump over. this is the right VM, and it is not, it is the other VM, just a second. So just to show you what this looks like, um, so I've run the maintenance solution on this VM, and I've got my user database is full, user database is diff, and user database is log, and I've got these scheduled basically according to that, the same schedule that Azure is defaulting to. The full is running weekly, diffs are running uh, every other day, and I think I've got the logs set up to run every two hours. Um, so, Evan, to your question, if you do want more control over your backup schedule, you can set this up, and then you can tweak these as you want. Um, and just to show you, uh, so this is a VM that has one of those marketplace images on it, and it will automatically generate a data and a log file. And because I was lazy, I didn't change the backup location. So this is actually writing the backups to the C drive. Nobody yell at me. Um, but if I take a look and come in, here's my backup folder. One of the things that I really like about Ola's solution is it will generate the files, file paths for you. So it takes the default backup path, which is why I'm writing this to the C drive path, but I've got a folder for my database. That's the only user database on this instance. And then it creates a diff full and log folder. So I've got a full from the 24th. I've got a diff from this morning at 4.30 a.m. And then I've got a bunch of log files. So, um, yeah, this will give you that control. If you, if you are looking for control over that backup process, this will give it to you. So that is that. And the next thing I will talk about are automated backups. So you stand up an instance of SQL Server running on a VM. Um, you have a the ability to set or generate automated backups or have Azure run backups in an automated fashion. And if we jump back over to my portal, 
When you provision one of these marketplace images, you'll notice that I have a virtual machine resource here, and then I also have a SQL Server virtual machine. If I go to the SQL Server virtual machine, oh, where do I want to be? Oh, this is bad. Let me just jump back and see. There we go. Okay, it is on the VM itself. Uh, that's for the VM. Hold on a second. I apologize for... There we go. I don't know why I didn't see that before. So this is the SQL Server virtual machine. Here is the backups link. Um, so you can enable automated backups. And once again, you can set a retention period. You need to specify a storage account here. So this is going to write to Azure Blob Storage. So you would specify that. And then you can set encryption on or off. You can back up system databases. You can enable that. And then you can also either use an automated schedule. And the automated schedule will be very similar to the schedule that's being used for PaaS. Or you can set your own. So this is another option. If you don't want to go through the process of provisioning agent jobs to run these backups, you can have Azure run them and you can configure a backup schedule here. And it's the same kind of idea. Uh, you can run it daily or weekly, I believe. Yeah, so you can run a backup, you know, either every day or you can set it to run on alternating days. And then you also give it a full backup time window. So you can say only run a full backup if it runs. I'm not sure what it does if you tell it you limit it to two hours and it runs it over. Um, but you can also set your log backup schedule. So this is another option you've got. Um, this is sort of kind of like halfway in between the PaaS offering and the completely Wild West unmanaged of IaaS. So any questions there? No hands up. OK. All right. And that was the automatic back, uh, automated backup demo. And actually, I didn't switch back to my slides, did I? There we go. So that was the automated backup demo. And I've also got screenshots in here. So the final thing I want to talk about is the Azure Recovery Services vaults. And I talked about gotchas. And this is where I've run into a number of things that I would not have expected based on what I'd read about this when I implemented it. So what Recovery Services Vault is, is it's a one-stop shop for all of your backups. Um, you have Azure, Azure VMs running SQL Server. You need to back those VMs up in order to back up the SQL Server databases. So this will provide you with you know, the backup of your VM in addition to the SQL Server database backups. Um, and as I said, you have to back up the VM for it to be able to discover the databases that are running on that VM. Um, and so you create a backup policy. So you are going to be backing up your VMs and You'll have a policy for your VMs, and then you create a policy for your databases. Um, and once again, you set backup frequency and the retention of the various backup points. Um, you tell it whether or not you want to run diff backups, and you also give it a log backup frequency and a retention for those logs. Um, just know that it will if you set the retention of your full backups to a number larger than 15, you'll have to maintain log backup. Actually, no, that's not it. If you set if you set the retention of your full backups say to seven days, it won't let you keep your log backups for 15 days because it just says your log backups aren't going to be any good if you don't have a full to back them up. So just keep that in mind. 
And it just gives you the informational thing that you won't take lock backups for anything in simple because it can't. Um, and then these are a couple of things to know. So um, with Recovery Services Vault, you can set your backups to be either locally redundant or geo-redundant. Geo-redundant does cost more. And once you have configured a backup policy with one of those redundancy levels, you can't change it. Um, so where this caused, didn't really cause an issue, but it added a little bit of work was had a client, they had configured a policy for their prod subscription and for their test subscription, and they were both set to geo redundant because that used to be the only option. They wanted to switch their test to be local re locally redundant to save some money. So what they had to do was create a new backup policy and then move all of the databases into that new policy. Um, when you create the backup policy for your VMs, you have the option to back up the OS disk only. And you want to select that because you don't, one, you don't want to be backing up your data and log disks because it will cause performance problems from your database. And two, you don't need to do it because you're going to be backing up those files, those databases using the SQL Server backups. Um, the portal will show backup health for each item and the backups are enabled and disabled at the database level. And that's another gotcha that I'll point out in a second, but something that's really important to note and something that I did not realize until I ran into a, a situation where it made me realize it is that it will show you backup health for each backup item. And the backup item in this case is going to be your SQL Server database. If you have a full backup fail, and backups will fail with Recovery Services Vault, but your transaction log backups continue to run, the health of that database will show as healthy because it still has the ability, as long as you haven't exceeded that retention period, you will still be able to restore that database to a point in time. It will just involve restoring a lot more log backups, which is technically true. I mean, the database is healthy and will be able to be restored, but me as a control freak DBA, that just makes the hair on the back of my neck stand up because in my mind, if the full backup has failed, I shouldn't know. And you can set up notifications for these things, but people don't offer, there, there are cases where you get flooded with notifications, you don't check them. So if I go to the dashboard to see the health of my database, I want to get a, at least a yellow light that there's something going on here. So just something to keep in mind when you're running Recovery Services Vault. Um, the client that we were working with wanted to have kind of a single pane of glass to look at all of the backups for their Azure resources. And I understand that. But as a DBA, there's just something that I want to be able to know that Okay, a full backup may have failed, even though it shows healthy. Um, and I think so. Um, this is related to availability groups. So you can create availability groups in Azure. Um, it works a lot like you are used to it working on-prem. There are a couple of other things that you need to set up, but it will run. But in terms of recovery services vault backing up availability group databases, um, the full backups are always going to run against the primary node. And the, re the reason for this, so with an availability group, one of the benefits of it is that you can offload your backups to a secondary node, but you need to run those full backups as copy only. There is no ability within Recovery Services Vault to run a full backup with copy only. And as a result, the full will always run against your primary. And this is another gotcha that I ran into where we had the backup scheduled the same way across all of the instances and they started running into performance problems because there were batch jobs running at the time the backups were running and it was killing performance on the servers. And so we had to tweak the backup schedules and run at 9 a.m. instead of the default, I think it was 10 p.m. Um, for those specific instances. Um, 
log backups will re run according to the backup preference for the AG. So if you say secondary only, because of the copy only restriction, it's going to still run those folds against the primary, but it will run your logs against the secondary. And that should work, but it's just something that you need to know um, going in. I mean, it's like I said, these were lessons that I learned through some difficult conversations with Microsoft. And just know this if you want to run Recovery Services Vault for SQL Server. Um, last we have thing, a, oh yeah. Before you continue, we have a, a hand up from Christopher. Sure. So Christopher, if you want to come off mute and ask the question, we'll see if you can hear me. Uh, um, it's faint. it's quite faint, but yeah, there we go. Yeah. Okay. Uh, let me turn up my volume. So the, there we go. Uh, my initial question was, what is the difference between was it local redundancy and geo redundancy? I just haven't heard those terms before. So I, think I talked about it when I was talking about PaaS. So with local redundancy, um, it's going to write locally to the region that your resource is running in. So I think in my case, I think I'm running these VMs in East US or East US 2. So if I set it to locally redundant, the backup files will be resident in that data center, the East US. Uh. And then geo redundancy. So each Azure data center has a geo redundant pair. It's paired with a different data center. So geo redundant, there will be an additional copy of that backup written to that pair. And so basically what geo redundancy gives you is if East US, you know, if just that data center becomes unavailable, you will still be able to access a copy of your backup. And that's where you know, the production versus test. You know, if you're restoring test from your prod copy, you probably don't need geo redundancy for test, but right. you want it for prod. Okay. All right. Uh, I did have another question. Sure. I may have missed this before. Uh, if you haven't, uh, could you at some point speak to if you have a naming nomenclature for any time you're naming your policies or service or anything that you recommend? Um, I think it just kind of, in my mind, it would just like to, whatever your naming policy is, you know, I, I, for the life of me, I cannot remember what the policies are named for the client that we're working with, with Recovery Services Vault. But, you know, just, I would just kind of fit it into whatever your naming standard is for other Azure resources. Okay. All right. It sounds like it's a good idea just to have one, though. Yeah, yeah. I okay. think I mean just so you know when you look at the policy because you can. I'll take a look at. We'll, we'll when I do the demo, I'll kind of look at policies and you'll see kind of how, what it looks like. And if you know what it, what the policy applies to, then you'll know what resources are there. If it's test versus prod, or if you have things that are application specific. All right. Thank you. You are welcome. Thank you, Christopher. Okay, so the final, I think this is the final slide before I do the recovery services vault demo, but um, for the restore, you can only, well, okay, so you have three options when you do a restore from a recovery services vault backup. You can restore it to an alternate location. Um, that location has to be in the same subscription as the source. Um, you can overwrite an existing database, and once again, I mean, by definition, it's going to be in the same subscription, or you can restore to file. So if you need to, um, so alternate location, if you want to restore to another instance of SQL Server on another VM in the same subscription, you can do that. Um, you can overwrite the existing database on the same server. But in the case of the client that I'm talking about, they have a prod subscription and a test subscription. So you don't have the ability to restore the database directly to that different subscription. So what you need to do is you need to restore to a file and this will effectively generate a .bak file. You give it a location to write to in the subscription and then you can copy that file to the other subscription and do the restore there. Um, this is another one of those gotchas where what 
would normally be a one-step process or potentially a two-step process of copying a backup file over and then doing the restore. You actually have to generate that backup file, do the copy, and then do the restore. So you, it will work. I, I, it can be automated. I have automated it, but it just you need to know that you're potentially looking at 3x the time of the restore to get the file and then move it over to the location, the destination that you want to put it. Um, and that will take us to the demo. So let me just flip over to my resource group. Sort that. This is my recovery services vault. So we're looking at my recovery services vault. Um, over here on the left, I have backup and this is where I would go when I was initially configuring this. Um, it asks me what I want to back up. I can back up a VM. I can actually back up a file share. So I mentioned this being sort of a one-stop shop for backups. You can back up file shares and you can also back up SAP HANA. Um, I don't really know what that is, so I'm not going to talk about it. But you can back up SQL Server and Azure VM. Um, and if I click this, I have the option to do a discovery, and this is where it will actually look at the VM I specify and see what backups or what databases are running there. Um, if I click View Details, you will see that for FBG SQL VM2, I have four databases that are available. Um, and if I add a database, I can do a rediscovery, and it will find that new database. Um, but I've already done this. I've already discovered the databases on that instance. And so then I can come in and configure backups. And this will take a second to populate. And this is where I have my policies. So I've got two policies. The hourly log backup is a default that will be there when you create a recovery services vault. And then I have a default backup schedule. And you can see here that I've already provisioned this. I've got my weekly Sunday. Um, and then I can set my retention for weekly, monthly, yearly. Um, I've got my differential backups scheduled to run Monday through Saturday. So I'm running my full on Sunday. And then my log backup frequency is every two hours to be retained for 15 days. Um, I don't have any items selected to add into this policy. So if I click Add, it will show me my instance, and it's the default instance, so it's just showing me MS SQL Server. And then I have the option to back up my system databases. I'm not doing it currently, but I could add these three in, and then click OK, and then it will tell me that it's going to add those into the policy. If I enable backup, I will get my deployment in progress. And this will run. While that's running, I'm going to jump back over to my recovery services vault. And we can take a look at my backup items. So currently, because those three backups are being added in, you can see that I've got one Azure virtual machine that's being backed up, and then one SQL database. And if I click on that, it will show you that I am backing up the Wide World Importers database on my default instance on VM2. And my backup is unhealthy. Why is it unhealthy? Why is my log chain broken? Did I run a backup? I may have run a backup on the wrong VM earlier today when I was making sure that everything would work. So what I can do is um, so this is the dashboard yeah so I must have screwed things up at about 432 this afternoon um, so I must have fired a backup on this server when I went to fire one on the other server but I can fix that by clicking backup now here I'm not going to do that now because I think I've kind of described basically what I would expect to see is this green line going all the way to the current time and that would tell me that my backup was healthy 
or my database had a healthy backup chain. Um, I can fix it by clicking backup now, but I can also do a restore from here. And once again, this is where I would um, choose alternate location, overwrite DB, or restore as files. Um, so I would give it a path uh, on the server that I want, and it would generate that .bxe file at that location. Um, that is that. I'm going to get out of that. One other thing to mention here is that so you know these backups are going to run. If for some reason I want to disable backups for a database or a group of databases. A prime example of this would be if the databases are running in an availability group and I wanted to restore one of them, I need to stop the backups for that. Or if I want to restore a group of them, in the portal, you have to manage each database individually. So I would have to come in here, if I've got 10 databases in an availability group, I would have to come in here for each one and stop the backup. Um, there are PowerShell commandlets and Azure CLI commands to manage this stuff. But in my experience, the stuff, you can do certain things with PowerShell, you can do certain things with CLI, but you can't do everything with one scripting language. And I haven't put on my scripting hat long enough to figure out how to combine the two. Um, but just another thing to keep in mind, if you're going to be running it, Recovery Services Vault for SQL Server, is you may be managing this stuff through clicking multiple times. And uh, it's less than ideal from my DBA mania for automating things. So just a, a gotcha. Um, and if you can figure out how to do the scripting, let me know, because I would be happy to, to leverage it. So I believe that is what I've got. Um, so I mentioned I've got resources here. Um, this gives you more information about automated backups. This is a link to Ola Hallengren's solution. Um, the backup and restore options. This is the Microsoft doc about SQL Server on Azure VM, and then more detailed information about recovery services vault. Um, and as I said, I think, uh, Carrie, you had asked the question about cost for uh, the backup retention for the PaaS offering. I'll drop another resource link in here for the cost estimator, and that'll give you the ability to see, um, you know, if I have seven days point in time retention and then for your long-term retention, what that cost will be. So any other questions? I have one. Um, yes. Regarding the discovery process that you demonstrated, do you have to run that when you add a new database or will it figure it out for you? That's a really good question. Um, I will show you. Let's go back over here, back up. Um, and I think is it here? Or is that part of the policy? Hang on. Because I presume this is running that uh, agent on this machine. So right. I was just curious if, if it can hook into that. Oh, where is the auto discover? So when you at some point during the provisioning process or the discovery process, there is the ability to set auto discovery on. And I'm blanking on where it is right now. So you can flip a switch that says if a database gets added, just automatically drop it into the policy. Um, I don't want to keep you hanging on the line where I'm poking around trying to find it, but I will find it and I will. Um, I will add it to the slide deck um, just so so you know where to find it because yes you can you can do that and that that's one of those settings where I think we defaulted to set that on for everything and then the test system they were constantly creating and deleting databases and it was generally all kinds of warnings and management was getting all antsy because they were seeing red flags in their email box and so thank you Randall that was a good question <laughs> 